Steve is a lifelong environmental advocate, and he has led efforts to raise literally hundreds of millions of dollars to permanently protect open space in California and, and 25 states around the country. His l environmental leadership has been recognized by the, tr uh, the Trust for Public Land and Save the Bay. Steve's a former senior advisor to California Governor Jerry Brown, and he worked in Governor Brown's office to help return California to solid financial footing. He's also served as an appointed California State University trustee. As a state senator, Steve has been a champion for affordable housing, open space preservation, civil rights, uh, uh, and a host of other things. Like most legislators, Steve's got an impressive, an impressive resume. But there is one thing that, uh, that uh, separates Steve from a lot of the uh, members of the legislature. And that's the fact that Steve has the courage and the fortitude to operate and, and work as an independent in the legislature. As Steve Peace talked about a little earlier, it is not an easy process for a member of the legislature to sit in a caucus, look at his peers, and look at the leadership and tell them, I disagree and I'm not going to give you my vote. That's not easy. Uh, and I've been around this process. Uh, I started as a staffer in the legislature in 1974, so I've been doing this for 41 years. There are not many legislators who have that kind of courage and are willing to stand up uh, and, and fight for what they believe is right for their constituents and their districts in the face of pressure from their peers and, and legislative leadership. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our newest state senator, Steve Glazier. Thank you, uh, Dan, for that nice introduction. Thank you all for being here. And uh, you know, uh, you hear the bio uh, uh, often, and but it's an interesting uh, to hear it right here in this place because uh, Dan mentioned that uh, I was the lobbyist for the California State Student Association. I know some of their leadership is here, but the irony is is that you know my office was right there. It was an office right in that corner with a couple windows. And this was, uh, yeah, Bob Mulholland, yes. This was uh, a, uh, a roof. And so as all kids or younger people might do, uh, we opened the window and we thought this big roof out here with a view of the Capitol, you know, why don't we put a couple chairs out and uh, maybe have a few meetings out here and maybe a lounge chair or two. And so we kind of, there was no access doors or anything. We kind of took over the roof. Um, and who would have known uh, 35 years ago that, uh, I would be here today, right, uh, as, as a member of the Senate. It's just, uh, you just can't think ahead that far. And uh, it's, uh, when, when uh, it was mentioned that uh, I was student body president at San Diego State, that's where I first met Steve Peace. Uh, he was the chief of staff to Larry Kapiloff in the assembly. And Larry was in one of those swing districts. Um, and uh, Steve was. Uh, doing his thing to help Larry get reelected and how we first met back in 19, uh, I would say that was 1978, Steve, 1978, that re-election. Uh, it, it, uh, it is sentimental to look back, but it's also, uh, it gives you some uh, hope that, uh, you know, the, the future just doesn't happen, you know, people have to carve it out. You can, you can make it, you can mold it, and uh, I'm going to talk a lot about, uh, you know, the top two and what it means, but it, it gives me some sense of confidence about uh, that it's still, there's some destiny within our hands here, and it's not just somebody else out there and uh, circumstances just driving everything. But So the obvious question that I get a lot is, did the top two make a difference for you? And uh, you may not know that uh, in my Senate primary, I ran against two assembly women, Democratic assembly women, a third Democrat, and then a Republican who uh, filed for the office, and then after the filing had closed, changed her mind, and endorsed my candidacy. And $12 million was spent in the race, $12 million. That's just an extraordinary amount of, of money for a single Senate seat that pays what? I think it pays, what, $94,000, $96,000 a year? Plus per diem if you take it. I'm not taking per diem, but if you took per diem, you can get that too. But there you go. But. Uh, I, let me just be clear, I would never have, I, I would not have entered this race, and I would never have won this race had there not been a top two primary, okay? 
So for all those who worked on it, I, I say thank you, not just for me, but for all that it, that it, that it means. Uh, and I, I strongly believe that the top two uh, is a pathway for independence uh, for Democrats and Republicans, uh, whether you're an office holder or if you're a candidate. And when I say for, for those who believe in independence, I'm not talking necessarily about someone who's unaffiliated with a political party. Uh, it can be, uh, you can be independent and be a Democrat and you can be a Republican. But it, to me, my definition of independent is someone who's there to represent people uh, rather than party or power. And that's, that's the essence of it to me, being independent, representing your district. I want to cover two things in my remarks uh, uh, today. One is I want to review how the top two can uh, affect the Democratic Party, my party, how it can, it can expand that party membership and, and influence or how it can reduce it. Um, one of the things the top two did for me is it gave me some room to define what it meant to me to be a Democrat. Um, and the question is, is my party gonna continue to have a big tent where diversity of opinion is tolerated or is it gonna be rejected? And the second thing I wanna talk to you about is I wanna propose to you some action steps that I think candidates and office holders can take right now to make this top two system work for them. And uh, I wanna review six action steps that I think can, can make a difference. But let me start with this issue of defining what it means to be a Democrat. Because there's a lot of definitions out there and there's some, some fairly common and well understood definitions for what it, what it really does mean to many today. And that is, is that, that government can be a force of good, that collectively we can come together and do things that are important, important for people, important for our country that uh, certainly in the area of promoting education, protecting the environment, caring for the poor, building a middle class, uh, protecting civil rights and human rights. And that's a fairly common, acceptable understanding of what it means to be a Democrat. And I certainly embrace all of those values of, of my party in, in all of those respects. But there's some other elements of, defi of definition of what it means to be a Democrat that are not so quickly embraced and understood by uh, members of the party, and, and yet they're important to me, and I tried to define myself in this context of uh, a Democrat plus, what else does it mean to you? And I, I talked about fiscal responsibility, and I, I went to a Democratic club, uh, I see Chuck Carpenter here, I don't think it was your club, but it was another club uh, in the Tri-Valley early on in the campaign, and one of the questions to me was, uh, after we'd all made our speeches, uh, the person stood up and said, how in the world can you be a call yourself a fiscal conservative and a Democrat? With great, uh, you know, like, are you kidding me? Um, and I, I said to her then, and I had to repeat it often, I said that the issue of fiscal responsibility should be a central tenet of being the Democrat. That if you think that dollar that you have to, to spend to help people in your community in the state is valuable, that that service is valuable, that you want to make sure that every dollar you have is spent right, is used well, it isn't wasted, because you know how important that dollar can be in terms of making our world a better, a better place. And I, I also talked a lot about accountability and oversight. It's not just about new laws, that if you have programs that are helping people, you want those programs to work. You don't want things to be done wrong. You don't want people to be playing games. Uh, and so accountability and oversight are core principles for me as a Democrat. And I also believe that, it, that, that local control matters. That if you believe that government closer to the people is better, that you can collectively work things out in your neighborhood, in your community, in your city, in your county, then you should be sure that before you get state government involved in dictating one way, one size fits all, you really want to empower people locally to try to figure those things out and have state government be a, a more of a last resort. So, and finally, uh, my belief that Democrats under should understand better than anyone that a healthy economy, vibrant business, are drivers for job creation, uh, for economic vitality, expanding tax revenue for those important programs that you think government should be involved in. Uh, and when you look at the institutions that we have in our communities, that I think first, as a Democrat, I think about consumers, I think about patients, I think about kids, I think about taxpayers. I don't think about the powers that drive these institutions that run these places. They're, they can be very important players, 
But at the end of the day, when we're talking about education policy, that issue should be about, well, what does it do for the kids? And if it's a health care policy, it should be, what should it be about for the patients or the consumers? So my view of what it means to be a Democrat, I think, creates the potential within the Democratic Party to broaden the number of people who'd want to affiliate with it. Many Democrats are fiscal conservatives. Many Democrats see the problems in, uh, of excess regulation and how that strangles job growth. Many, many independents and Democrats uh, would join, uh, would be a part of the Democratic Party, shouldn't, would, certainly wouldn't leave it if the, the party itself showed their ability to fight for the common good rather than narrow and powerful interests. And so I see the top two as a positive path forward for Democrats if they embrace a much broader vision of what it means to be a Democrat. But there's a negative path forward as well for the party, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and I've identified three examples of where I think that for Democrats, you have this positive path forward of expansion and inclusion and embrace of a broader party message, and then you have another path forward that I think is a downward spiral for the party. And there's three things that uh, I want to talk about. The first one is that Democratic leaders should stop being narrow-minded about what it means to be a Democrat. Being different than them is not necessarily being less progressive or less democratic. Number two, we need to stop these crazy false attacks against fellow Democrats. De Democratic leaders continue on a path of demonizing Democrats who are different from them calling them uh, less progressive. And this has been going on now for the last couple years, and I've certainly had a front row seat for it. In the uh, last Senate election, just, it ended just weeks ago, 37 mailers were sent out attacking me by my party leaders, 37. And they said things like, uh, I'm anti-woman, lifelong pro-choice. I'm anti-woman, I'm anti-public schools, I support George Bush. I'm tobacco's best friend. I'm the, the guy the oil companies love. And the list goes on and on and on. And you read this stuff and you see these flyers and you go, you, you've got to be kidding me. What are they doing? And what they have done is they've taken this playbook that's used against Republicans, because that's the old way, right? You'd nominate your Democrat in a primary, they'd run against a Republican. You have to demonize the Republican. And what they've done now is said in this open primary context, we need to go and demonize, yeah, yeah, the other Democrat who's not our first choice. They've got to be the devil, the enemy, and they've taken that playbook and they've applied that to Democrats. And the third thing that's a, a, a big negative and as far as I'm concerned and contributing to this potential of a downslide within the affiliation of the Democratic Party is their system of endorsing candidates. There are many acceptable Democrats out there in fact, there are candidate pools for offices that are filled with lifelong Democrats. But that party has made the choice that, that it's their power to anoint one, a single one, as the Democrat. And then everybody else has become now, by default, the bad Democrat. And I think that's a very unhealthy thing. And my view is that if party leaders continue to be narrow-minded, engaging in false attacks against fellow Democrats, and continue in their king and queen making role, that the public's embrace of the Democratic Party is going to continue to decline. And it's going to escalate the proportion of voters selecting third parties or simply being unaffiliated with a political party. So there are opportunities and there is peril in this top two for those who want a vibrant Democratic Party. Next, I want to talk to you about six things that I think centrist candidates, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, can do right now to uh, be a good legislator uh, or be a good candidate. The first one, and this is very uncommon, is that you need to build a, a base of support from real people, not special interests, real people. If you looked at the campaign reports for every member of the legislature, how many real people are you going to find in those campaign reports? Out of those hundreds of donations, how many of them came from someone in their district? 
either party, you're not going to find very many. One of the reasons that I became a vibrant candidate when I ran for the assembly last year is that through my life of civic engagement, of charitable work, of community service, that I had been able to accumulate uh, 500 people who contributed $400,000 to me, unaffiliated with any special interest, any. And it was the $25 check, it was the $500 check, but it made me a viable candidate. And it gave me the independence that was very important to how I looked and saw issues uh, in our political system. And so building a base of support from real people is critical. The second thing that I think is very important is that you need to define, disclose your political philosophy. You know, who are you? How are you going to base decisions as a legislator? What, what is it going to come from? Is it going to come from your party's ideology, or do you have your own? So one of the things that I did in my campaign is I defined my philosophy. And I called it my governing principles. And so one of the things my staff and I had fun with uh, just a few days ago is we read our own little baseball card which has been put on your, uh, your tables. And if you turn it over, because I know you have my picture up front, but if you turn that over, you'll see my governing principles uh, for why I ran and how I was going to approach the decisions that I was going to face uh, as a potential legislator. And what you're going to see in there are the, some of the same principles that defined me as a Democrat because I was a Democrat and was, and, and, and was labeled as such on the, bar, uh, on the ballot. And if you look through these principles, it says, number one, represent the people of your district rather than party or special interests. For many here in the room, that may seem pretty common sense. But for those who are in the political world, they'll recognize how bold of a stance uh, that, that would be. Number two, maintain a balanced budget to allow government to help people, and most importantly, for people to have confidence in government. If people and the, tax, the taxpayers don't have confidence that you're doing your job, they're not going to give you another dollar. So you want to do a good job on budgeting, and you want people to have confidence to give you that dollar to do a good job in doing things you think are important. Three, pursue bipartisan decisions. Excuse me, bipartisan, yeah, decisions. I, my first bill that I introduced, I'm pleased to say, had Republican co-authors from the start. And it's a practice that I think is very important in our governing, is that from the start, Find ways to work with both parties. Find common ground if you can. Number four, emphasize education as the gateway to opportunity and prosperity. Number five, work hard to set priorities and hold the line on taxes. It goes back to trust and confidence in government. You have to be seen from either party as a, a willingness to make choices, right? Every good program doesn't deserve a bill, doesn't deserve a dollar. You have to make tough choices out there. The public deserves to have you there to make those hard choices. Incorporate environmental protection as a part of every decision. Number seven, empower local decision making. I talked about that. It's more responsible and it's more trustworthy. Uh, number eight, advance accountability and efficiency. Nine, promote civility and respect for all people, and for, no matter your perspective. And finally, number 10, conduct yourself always with honesty and integrity. So I defined myself. It wasn't a democratic view, it wasn't a Republican view, it was my view. When people come into my office in the Capitol now, what do they see when they walk in? My governing principles on the wall. And when they come in, they ask me for a vote, or they ask to engage. We, we talk about it in the context of these governing principles, because I want to understand how it fits and where it doesn't, why, and why it should drive a decision about budget or legislation. So number two on my action steps are define your philosophy, share it with people. Don't have it be uh, uh, restricted by necessarily what your party tells you to do, or even any special interest that you're close to. Number three, reject party support for nonpartisan offices. Reject party support for nonpartisan offices. Today, the Republicans and Democratic parties look at these uh, positions for city government, county government, for your school board. They look at it as the farm team. And so they want to influence the farm team because they think that by getting that person on the farm team, it means that when they run for a partisan office, they're going to have a, a heads up, right? They're going to be able to get that person elected. You know, I, I asked my uh, staff to uh, go back and look at our state constitution. It was enacted in 1850 about why we have nonpartisan offices at the local level. And our founding fathers and mothers for, our, for the state of California examined that issue in great detail because they put a provision in our constitution on that matter. And it says this, 
all judicial school, school, county, and city offices, including the superintendent of public instruction, shall be nonpartisan. A political party or party central committee shall not nominate a candidate for nonpartisan office and the candidate's party preference shall not be included on the ballot for the nonpartisan office. So this is not a new thing. This is not a California forward thing. This is the founders of our state recognizing the dangers of making these local offices partisan offices. And they acted to put it in our state constitution. So when you have these parties coming to you and saying, you want to run for the school board? You want to run for the city council? Come in and, and fill out our questionnaire. Come be a part of our endorsement process. My message to them is get the hell out. Get the hell out. You don't belong there. There's a reason these offices are nonpartisan. This is not a place for you. And I, and I urge my, my fellow office holders and candidates at the local level to don't buy into that farm club mentality. It's not healthy for our democracy. Number four, be a problem solver. Seems like common sense again. Be a problem solver. But so much of it is about partisanship, about special interests. But what you find when you do polling of voters out there is that one of the top values they always have for people running for office is just to be a problem solver, be thoughtful, balance the choices. Don't necessarily be righteous. Righteousness has caused more wars in the world than any other quality uh, of, 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 of anyone. It's just that the belief that they know the way. There's one way. There's one way to do it. And I think the voters appreciate people that recognize that it's not all black and white, there's gray, and that they have to work together to help try to figure that out. Be being a problem solver is a great quality in a candidate for office, as well as, a, uh, as an office holder. Number five, stop filling out those secret special interest questionnaires. You guys know what I'm talking about. They're everywhere. You run for city council, you get these questionnaires from special interest. You run for president of the United States, you get the same questionnaires. And you know what? Most of them are all secret. It's the new back room of politics, the, uh, the candidate questionnaire. And for those who, who want to be thoughtful about governing and our politics, they, they know that nothing is so simple as a yes or no in a candidate questionnaire. Nothing. Doesn't take into account any type of real time circumstance. Doesn't take into account budget that you're facing at the time or your economy. Doesn't uh, give you the nuance of the language, any new information that you may be uh, accruing because you're a thoughtful person. But those questionnaires are not meant for you to be thoughtful. When you get those questionnaires, and in my legislative race last year, I got 34 of them. 34. You know what answers they want. There's no question about that. And it's a part of this contract that very powerful interests want to engage you in right from the start. And it's an unhealthy thing for our democracy. So I encourage you to don't fill them out. And if you do, disclose so everybody can see what you say from all sides. Be honest about it. And finally, number six is stand up for your beliefs and be willing to lose. Curb your enthusiasm. Curb your and that's a TV show. Curb your ambition enough so that you don't let it drive the choices that you make. I mean, you know, we run for this office because we think we can make a difference, right? But if you get so ambitious, like everything's wrapped up into running and winning, that's where the problem really begins. Because then you start saying, "Ah, oh, I got to please that interest. I got to make this group feel happy with me," and it takes you down this very slippery slope where you lose your core values of why, you, why you're running, what matters. And so it's kind of ironic, right? Say a candidate for office, one of the things you need to do to win is to curb your ambition. It's not that you shouldn't look for service opportunities, but you've got to be willing to get in the fight and lose and, and be willing to fight another day. You know, that it's just not going to happen. It doesn't happen for that race, it's OK. You know, life goes on, but you stay true to your values. You made good choices. You didn't sell out. And that's a healthy thing. And it's, I know it's a difficult one, uh, given the ambitions that people uh, have when they run for these offices. You know, great leaders are remembered for making their vote and their voice impactful. 
They didn't go along with party. They didn't go along with power. And you can see those rare examples in the executive and legislative branches and even in staff roles. Uh, you can see those examples of where they were great leaders. And think about it, in the last 50 years, how many state leaders can you think about who stood for something against the type? How many can you think of? People say, I, I'm coming into the legislature because I want to make a difference, right? Well, we all do it. So how many of them can you think about? Not too many, right? It's unfortunate. I can think about a few. I think about uh, Mayor Chuck Reed from San Jose. Took on the pension issue, not because he wanted to, because it was busting his budget and he cared about the services that were being provided. Demonized, taken on the issue of pension reform. I think about uh, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Not easy for me as a Democrat to say, right? But he was out there on climate change and had the courage to stand up for his convictions when he got great grief from his own party. I think about uh, Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa, originally a labor leader, became mayor of Los Angeles, cared about kids, concerned about schools, engaged in education reform in a very hostile environment, showed a lot of courage, has a lot of my respect for me. I think about non-politicians like David Crane, leader on pension reform. You know, David penned an article a few days ago, maybe it was a few weeks ago, where he said that if you call, if you uh, present false and incomplete pension assessments, which some state agencies were doing, he called it a criminal act. I couldn't believe it. If you present false information about pension information, it's a criminal act. A lot of, a lot of boldness in saying what I think many people worry about, that we're not getting the facts. I think about Governor Brown. How can I not? I think about him uh, in regard to his tax and spend views. You know, he was frugal back in the 70s. People don't remember that. I think it was just uh, after he was re-elected re to his third term. But uh, his, his view about spending and taxes have been quite conservative and uh, against tight. I also think about his uh, promotion of charter schools. Uh, in Oakland, he got so frustrated with the school system, he started two charter schools, which he continues to support today. How many of you people, uh, folks here know uh, Susan Kennedy? Hasn't been out of the political uh, world too long. You know, she was a lifelong Democratic activist. Lifelong. She head of uh, NARAL, Bob NARAL. Yeah. She was a political director of the Democratic Party. She was up here at the, the, in the building here with us. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Not Susan, a of mine. not a friend of yours, no. But Susan, you know, she took the bold step and she became a chief of staff to a Republican governor. Very difficult choice to make. Has a lot of my respect for doing that. And you can't go through a list of people that made a difference, went against type without mentioning uh, Senator Abel Maldonado, who forced that top two on the ballot against the wishes of both parties, and which we're here to talk about. But in their own unique ways, these are all incredible role models uh, of independence for all of us, for candidates and for party leaders. By the way, who was the last independent to serve in the legislature? Can anybody remember who that was? What was it? Was it Bach? What year was that? She was green. She wasn't independent. The last one was Quentin Kopp, senator from San Francisco. So he ran as an independent and was elected from 86 to 96. And who here is from San Diego? I know Steve Peace knows the answer to this. But who was the San Diegan who was a Democratic senator and changed to independent and then ran as an independent? Lucy, are you going to save that for the questions? Lucy Calais. <laughs> and here's one of the interesting things about being independently minded, is that you can, I think, and, and there'll be some argument about this, but I think you can make a big difference in the legislature uh, by being independently minded, and it's a very simple formula. It's very simple. If you're a Democrat, you just have to be willing to say no. And if you're a Republican, you just have to be willing to say yes. That's it. Now you're a consequential leader in the legislature because you're not going to just get in your corner and do what both parties tend to do uh, in the legislature. So this top two combined with uh, courage of independence can make you a, an effective game changer for your district and also for a representative government. And one of the nice things, and Steve Peace and I were talking about this before I came up here, that you know the state senate has a rich tradition of honoring each member's right to vote their district. And uh, 
I've taken about 300 votes so far in the Senate. And in every case where I had a discussion with the pro tem, uh, he has respected that Senate tradition and, and urged me to stay true to my district views. Uh, Senate President Pro Tem, Kevin DeLeon is a great leader. And I'm grateful that for how he has worked with me in service to my district. So for me, the top two makes me enthusiastic about the future of our representative democracy. Uh, it promotes liberty and freedom for the greater good, which is so much more enduring than being a, a water carrier for a, an interest group. The top two message to the established political parties is clear. You gotta broaden your appeal to general voter concerns or continue to shrink your membership and your clout. And finally, a message to voters. I say to all of them, please continue to pay attention and look beyond party labels. Vote the person first and the party second. It's liberating and it's fun. And that's the way to shake up the body politic and reinvigorate our representative democracy. Thank you all for what you do. It's been very generous at this time, and we're going to take actually two or three questions and get it out and respect the time on the panel. So, Senator, if you want to choose, if you want, no, oh, you want me to? Okay. <laughs> I call on Alex. Thank you, Senator, for your comments. Um, I was interested in your governing principles, and I can agree with most. The only one I have a question about is number five: the whole the line on taxes. Do you use that as a grover Norquist type of pledge, or would you look at the circumstances that's happening um, in the state of time? Great, thank you for your question. No, I, I think pledges are uh, not a healthy place for the reasons I talked about earlier, that circumstances change and you don't really know your budget situation, your economy situation, and all the rest. No, I, I, I talk about it in terms of uh, a basis in which you're faced with questions of raising taxes. That when you're faced with a situation of raising taxes, you've got to first say, are we setting priorities well? Are there things that are less important that we've been doing for a long time that can, where that those resources can be used in a way that those new needs or desires are being raised? And that, um, that taxes should, should be the last alternative, not the first. And so when I talk about hold the line, I'm trying to create the construct in which you examine proposals for new programs. There have been a number of bills that have come up in the Senate already for me that I think are great programs. Uh, I'll give you an example, early childhood education. There's no doubt in my mind that early childhood education is a very incredibly important element to, to helping our youngest uh, uh, state residents become the best that they can be. There's just no question about it. The research is out there. But for me and a question like that, it's like, well, okay, are we doing everything else that state government's doing well enough where we have those resources that we can direct to that very important place? And that's that re-examination, and that's the issue of priorities, and it's looking at then issues of taxes as a last resort, not, not at the front end of that examination, okay? Whoever has the microphone. Yeah, I'm here. Quick question. So, your number one uh, governing principle is that you will represent the people and not political parties' special interests. What do you say to critiques that having to work for jobs you have with some of these other uh, special interests that you'll be able to represent the people? Well, I think if you looked at the uh, first, I think if you looked at the arc of my career, uh, what about working for the Trust for Public Land for 12 years? You know. Uh, what about working for Jerry Brown? Does that uh, create a conflict? I mean, we all have all that stuff's out there. If you think that uh, my, my work with Jobs Pack is disqualifying, that's, that's no problem. But it's, uh, you know, I, I, what I'm saying is, is that it's not uh, the party that should drive that, uh, that choice or that special interest. It should be your district. And so you should judge me based on whether I'm representing my district, not based on whether I'm a Democrat or Republican or I work for Jobs Pack, or I work for anybody else. Judge me on what I'm saying and what I'm doing. That's the test, and that's what I speak to there. Okay, well, uh, yeah, um, you obviously have been involved in politics, and you talked about it at the very beginning. When you worked in that office, 
have, have you seen your political ideology evolve? Were you once more partisan or more ideological? Have, have things changed since you started your career in politics when yeah, you no. were very young? And why? Um, yeah, no, there's no doubt. I was asked the question a few months ago by a reporter who was doing a profile on me, and he said, uh, he asked the question, he said, he had, he had, uh, had asked me a lot about my college years and my activist years, and he said, "Would your, would would your 21-year-old self vote for, vote for you today?" And I just knew that was a very dangerous question. <laughs> so first, I had to make a joke just to give myself a little more time to think about how I wanted to answer it. I said, "So you're going to put me on the couch? Is that what you're doing?" And uh, but I said to him, "I said uh, no, no. My when I was sitting in that office." Uh, uh, if I was here today in, in the contest in the Senate race, I wouldn't have voted for me. And um, I think it's because um, as you get older and as you learn more about the political process, you see less black and white, you see a lot more gray. And you also see where good intentions don't just happen uh, because it's the right thing, or the necessary thing. It's like it's, there's a balancing of interests. And certainly there's... Uh, there's limits. We have li there's resource limits. There's budget limits, and so I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten greater appreciation for things like a budget, um, and that is not just spending for what you want to get today. You have to think about the longer term, and so you you elongate your vision about what your what how your choices are supposed to fit in for. Is it for that day, that night, going out that night, or is it for the next month and your rent, or is it the next year and where you want to be, or is it the next generation in California and what you want for them. And so as you, as you understand constraints and as you understand the, the, the timeline in which you're trying to frame a good choice, I think it does change you and it does change how you look at things that on the surface seem like great things to do and things we'd really like to have. And so I think that grounding hasn't changed my view of what it means to be a Democrat. It's broadened that view, as I talked about earlier, about fiscal responsibility. It's, it's tied into getting those resources to do good things. You need to have trust and confidence in government. It's all connected. And so as I have uh, broadened my perspective and understanding, it has changed my view, and it, has, it, it makes me who I am today. But my 21-year-old self wouldn't, uh, wouldn't like it. But that's, that's where I am. And this is going to be a last question. Oh, thank you. Steve, the people in this room really don't know what your district is. Your district's made up of the most Republican part of Contra Costa County and the most working class Democrat part of Contra Costa County. So if I were in your shoes, how do I represent all those people and get them the services that they need in Moraga and they need in Bayport? Great, great question, Chuck. And, and you're, of course, you're right that it's, it's a challenge that we all face as representatives. I mean, I, I have about a little bit less than a million people, about 20 cities, all different. And it's the challenge that I put to my staff and to me every day on these things. It's like, you know, we're trying to find that balance. I'll tell you something that's going to surprise you is that the registration of my district almost exactly matches the registration of California. 44% Democratic, 28% Republican. So what I'm trying to do in my area is not something that's out uh, on the extremes. You know, it's, it's the, uh, it's, I, I think that it's reflective of what the challenge is that's facing our state leaders too. And as we look for people running for governor for US Senate, that, that it's not so different to, that, that everybody matters we have resource limitations, we have choices, and how do you balance those things together? And so it, it, it is what uh, I wake up to do, and it's what I go to sleep thinking about. How can I do this? Because for me, it is about trying to find that balance. Um, and so you'll see it as my voting record evolves. Um, I mean, what you're going to see today is that of the 300, this is going to surprise some people. Because you know, when I came up here, they said he's not really a Democrat. And, Nobody's going to talk to him and blah, blah, blah that, that opponents say. But uh, my staff keeps a tally of it. They're in the back, and they'll correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, of the 300 votes that I've cast thus far, 93% of them have been with my party. That's going to surprise a lot of people. Okay? But the Democrats applauding. And Mulholland left, so he should have heard that. Oh, there he is. Oh, yeah, you guys are in the same group. 
Okay, 93%. But you know, there's, so there's 7% where I didn't. And some of those bills are important bills to constituencies in the Democratic Party. And, uh, but for me, you know, I'm always kind of revisiting, reviewing, rethinking. Um, but, but it is that challenge. And I, I think that, uh, you know, there's, there's Republicans in my district that are pretty pleased. I will, will very likely be the most conservative Democrat in the legislature. How about that? When all the voting records are compiled at the end of this year, and you look at all the Democrats, I think uh, almost undoubtedly I will be seen as the most conservative. Now that may be with 93 percent, yeah. So the irony of that is that uh, there's a lot of Republicans and independents that are pretty pleased with my voting record thus far. How about that? Because they see me doing things on some issues that are important to them that they hadn't really seen been done before. I partnered with Republicans against this cap on school reserves. I just did a press conference yesterday that goes contrary to the leadership of my state and of, of my party that put a cap on, on every local school district reserves last year, guys. Wasn't that good vote? And I opposed it uh, during the campaign and I sat there with the minority leader of the Republicans at a press conference announcing my support for my authorship of a new bill to reverse that. Uh, but the good news is I did it standing with seven other Senate Democrats. Think about that. Now that's a change. Seven Democrats in the Senate, some of whom voted for that cap through conversations and review and continued thinking about what's best have now come to the conclusion that they're willing to stand with me and say that wasn't a good choice and that we should, we should do something differently. That we believe in local control. That we wanna give financial stability to our schools. And so we don't know where this bill is going to go, right? But that's a change. That's a change. And that's a top two primary change, right? That you're giving the power of incumbents from the Democratic Party and from the Republican Party to say, hey, we don't have to sit in our corners now. Let's, let's see if we can be constructive problem solvers. That was not a good choice last year. Let's revisit it and try to do something better. It's very healthy and very exciting, and I'm glad to be a part of it. It isn't me. It's you, those who are trying to find a better course, a better path are creating these opportunities for people like me to try to try to figure it out and to try to uh, cooperate and, and uh, collaborate and build consensus in ways that haven't been done. We're all waiting to see where this leads, right? The academics probably were up here this morning and they're gonna be up here this afternoon, you know, taking the two years of history or whatever it's been, three years, and trying to create instant answers to whether it's working or it's not. So it's not, and that's not a surprise, but a lot of encouraging signs from my point of view, not just about my election, but about the ability to bridge, build bridges, work together, build consensus, so our choices are better, smarter, longer lasting for everybody. So with that, I say thank you again for listening. I look forward to working with you.